Hello, and um, welcome to the next video. Um, we will be talking about primary bonds in this video. So for primary bonds, there are three main types. There's ionic, there's covalent, and there is metallic. And each of these different types of bonds are created by the way the electrons are associated with individual atoms. So before we had this kind of view of an atom that we discussed where we have a nucleus and we can have electrons um, if they're in an s orbital they're kind of in a sphere shaped shape around the electron but if they're something like a p orbital then they're kind of dumbbell shaped and they'll be coming off the atom like this in three principal directions. So each one of these um, subshells has two electrons associated with it. And so this S shell can have, you know, spin up, spin down. This P shell can have two electrons up and down. This P shell up and down. And this P shell up and down. So the question comes, what happens if we have not just one isolated atom, but we bring in another atom close to this original atom? Well, there's something that we know called the Pauli exclusion principle. So the Pauli exclusion principle says that two electrons can't be in the same state, which means they can't occupy the exact same energy level and the exact same spin as another electron. Well, if we get another atom close to this original atom and it has subshells that look identical to this original atom, that means that in order to not violate the Pauli exclusion principle, these shells need to deform and they need to change their shape and they need to change their energy state. And that's not discussed very much, but what ends up happening is instead of having these nice separated um, energy shells and subshells, they turn into weird different shapes. Sometimes you have something called hybridization. Um, sometimes you create something called a band gap. Um, but you end up kind of smearing some of these energy shells together. And different shells will smear in different ways. And we'll get into the way that they deform or the way that these electron um, orbitals deform later on when we're talking about electronic band structures. But um, this nice pretty view of the way electrons move around an atom doesn't necessarily hold true when you have um, more than one atom in close proximity to each other. So if we take a look at sodium and chlorine. So sodium has this one little extra electron in the 3s shell. And chlorine is missing an electron in the 3p shell. And you say, wait a second. So what you're telling me is, is in order for this extra electron in sodium to go into chlorine, if I take a chlorine and sodium atom and bring them close to each other, it needs to increase in energy because the 3p orbital is higher than the 3s orbital in energy. Well, again, that smearing, that kind of electron cloud deformation associated with bringing two elements together kind of switches that around. Also, you have um, the energy associated with completing a shell, having a complete shell, which is 
um, much more energetically advantageous than increasing um, from the 3S to the 3P shell. And so what ends up happening is the sodium atom was originally, you know, this size, let's say. The electrons floating around was that size. What happens when it gives up that electron is it becomes smaller and it becomes positively charged. And the chlorine atom, what happens is it used to be this size and it becomes larger and it becomes negatively charged. And now because we have ions and they're close to each other, they will attract each other. Now, in this particular type of bond, which is not covalent, it's, um, it's ionic, what we notice is that the electrons are tied to the specific ions. So chlorine holds on tightly to its electron uh, that it gained, and sodium doesn't want to have anything to do with that electron. And so these ions can be separated. Um, if you put uh, salt in water, these ions will go into solution, and they will separate from each other and take their associated electrons with them. Now if we take two elements that are closer in electronegativity, not so different in electronegativity, what we see is that one they don't really want to give up their electrons and they don't really want to accept their electrons um, in, in the same way as an ionic bond. And so this is what we call a covalent bond. And what happens is this hydrogen will want to donate one of its electrons to the 2P uh, subshell of oxygen. Uh, but oxygen has two vacancies, not just one. And so two hydrogens get together, and they both partially donate their electrons to oxygen. Well, we know that the S subshell if we were to draw it, is spherical in nature, kind of like this. We also know that a P subshell, and I'm only going to draw one P subshell because the other two are filled, the P subshell is something like this, kind of a figure eight. <clears throat> But what happens is, again, this is one way that shells can kind of deform, is you get something called sp hybridization. And so what happens is this S shell and this P shell kind of combine in a, in a unique way. And you'll get kind of a new shape of P shell that is kind of like this where one side, one lobe, is larger than the other. And when we were talking about, um, when we're talking about the way that these atoms interact with one another, now you have a situation where on one section of the atom, you have a concentration of electrons. And then on other sections, in, in three dimensions, you don't have the same electronic structure. It's not symmetrical. And so what that causes is that causes a directional bond between different atoms. And we know from, um, from previous lessons and from previous experience that hydrogen and oxygen, when they bond, they bond in a very specific way. Oxygen will be here, and hydrogen will sit out here at a very specific angle. And that angle, what we call the bond angle of a covalent bond, for 
uh, two hydrogens and one oxygen is 104.5 degrees. And that is the same for every single water molecule. And so instead of the electrons being tied to an individual atom in ionic bonding, like an ionic bonding, we have electrons that are tied to groups of atoms or pairs of atoms, and we call these molecules. So um, there's a huge difference between covalent bonds and ionic bonds in that covalent bonds are directional, as shown by these bond angles. Now the last type of bond, or primary bond, is called metallic bonding. So if we look at something like aluminum, we see, okay, this aluminum, two aluminum atoms. If we say, okay, this aluminum has one extra electron in the 3P shell. This uh, aluminum has one extra electron in the 3P shell. So we start bringing them together. What's going to happen? Well, both of them have vacancies, and both of them have extra electrons. And they have identical electronegativity. So you'd say, okay, a covalent bond is going to form. But that's not true. What ends up happening is the smearing of these uh, electron shells, they smear in such a way that no individual atom has ownership over an electron. So ionic and covalent, um, ionic and individual atoms held onto electrons, covalent molecules hold on tightly to electrons, but in metals, no particular atom has is and no particular electron is tied to a specific atom. So what ends up happening is something called the electron um, kind of sea of electron model for uh, uh, metals. And so if we were to look at the aluminum atoms in a metal, it kind of line up like this. And they would each give up one of their electrons. In the 3P shell, they just kind of let them float around. And so what happens is the core, or the, the atoms, are positively charged. And they're sitting inside a sea of electrons. And the electrons flit back and forth between all these different ions and they just kind of float around and move around. And that's why if you put an electron into a metal, um, an electron will squeeze out the other end and that's what we call electrical conduction. It's because you put in an electron on one end and then um, you're, it, it doesn't want to have that, electro, that extra electron and so it just um, shoves it out the other end. And so metals we consider are conductors because these electrons have a high mobility. And so um, because no particular electron is um, tied to an atom, and we have this sea of electrons kind of binding, it's the glue that binds um, these materials together, we have um, non-directional. These are non-directional bonds as well.